Welcome to Faith in the Flesh. This is a summer 2022 educational programming series at Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Matt Skinner. I'm on staff here at Westminster, and I'm joined today by Beth Hart Anderson, who I think is well known to many in the church. But if not, uh, you've been here 20, is it three, three years? 23 years, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and um, a lot of people know me best by that I'm married to Tim, who is the head of staff here. Um, and for a while I was known because I was the mother of three, our three kids. And um, a lot of my own role has been in the uh, caretaking mm. of our family rather than serving in the church. That was uh, a choice that we made along the way. Two clergy full-time is a lot of price to be paid for the family involved. Sure. Which is its own form of calling or vocation it as well, is. of course, right? It is, yeah. indeed, indeed. Yeah. And it took a little while for me to wrap my head around that, but um, I actually uh, feel pretty strongly about it now. Sure, excellent. Well, I'm super excited that you're here, not just because I get a chance to talk with you, but because one of the things that I know about you is that you have an artistic bent, a talent, uh, maybe a calling too, and in this series, we've talked a lot about your head and kind of training your attention and your mind. And we've talked about contemplation and things like that and service. But we haven't talked much about creativity, making things, and how that is part of uh, spirituality, how that is part of how we imagine God or uh, connect with God or communicate about God to others. And so I wonder if maybe to start, you could just tell us something about your art what you do, why you do it, how you started, how you think about it? So art. Um, I'm actually more, you use the word creativity. I'm way more comfortable with that word um, rather than artist. Um, uh, especially Tim really loves to call me an artist, but it's not a term I resonate with very easily. Um, I think of artists as people who have the ability to draw and paint and sort of make things um, out of nothing. And I tend to create out of what already is. Um, I like to use the lost and the least and broken bits and repurpose things. And so I've always said that I make stuff out of junk. Um, so, and that, um, I, I did have training in undergrad. I was an art major. Um, but I think, if anything, that set in me a sense of lack rather than of plenty. Um, I didn't see myself easily in the artist community of that. Um, institution and so I set aside my creativity for a while um, and pursued um, a calling to ministry and I didn't quite see how those things fit together. I tried in seminary and asked some professors and there were some people who were helpful um, but there were no there was no coursework nothing people weren't doing much yeah. You were at a Presbyterian school, right? I was in a Presbyterian <laughs> school. So, and and actually, I really found um, a place of belonging, um, and that work that was um, that really involved my head more than my hands was really life giving at that particular point in my life. Um, I, the world opened up. I found that I had a place to breathe and be um, myself and not who others were expecting me to be. And so that was a real gift. Uh, but it wasn't until later that I started bringing back the creative into anything that um, looked like maybe liturgical art or art related to my faith. Because some of the pieces I'm from most familiar with are the creations. Maybe I, should, I don't know how you prefer me to talk about them. Yeah, that's them. fine. Whatever. I've seen in a liturgical context, mm -hmm. um, crosses, things you've done with, with vines and, and yeah, stuff that used um, to be alive. Am I remembering this correctly? Um, and uh, Well, when we lived in San Francisco, um, we started a small group that looked at liturgical seasons, and uh, we called them Festival Sundays. And we incorporated 
art of all sorts in those seasons. And we, because there was a team of people, um, we made art that wasn't made to last. And that made it easier for the congregation to accept into their midst for a bit. And for me, it made it easier to create. I wasn't trying to create something that would last for the ages. A lot of it was paper. Um, again, found objects, things that could be had for not much money um, because there was not much budget for this. And um, we found that it was exciting and it um, opened up worship and our ways of seeing and feeling the presence of God in our midst. Because um, we all learn in different ways. Some of us are tactile visual, um, visual learners. Right. So say more about that, that the idea of opening us up, I think was the, a, a phrase you used, and to encounter God in different ways. What is it about a visual, tactile thing that has the power to do that? Or is it the worship setting? Or is it everything? I mean, what do you... I think it's a little bit of all of the above. Um, I think that things have changed in the world. But for a long time, um, people were approached as though we were just our heads. And we learn in so many different ways. And, you know, music has always been part of our worship. And um, that's also an art, um, and that's a way that we're opened up to um, the word that is being spoken in church. Sometimes it's sung, and the melody, and there are sometimes chords and things that are played that just break you open, that make you feel more. And I think um, during the Reformation, we were worried about idols, and um, the church was full of idols, and we were no longer really praying um, to God. We were praying to these statues and things, and so we got rid of all of it, but we did throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, and we're playing catch-up. Yeah, we are. And so I think that people are comforted to see that, oh, the things that I experience in the world, that I see in the world, they too are holy. Yeah, I like that. that. A thing can be holy. We've talked a bit in this series about holy places or experiences, but yeah. the idea of, of things, and especially, like you said, um, temporary things or things that yeah, ephemeral. aren't built to last. Yeah, ephemeral is a great word. Yeah, yeah. I that. like the ephemeral. Why is that? Um, I like the impermanence. It's a reminder that we are all ephemeral in many ways. We just think that we're here for a really long time, but really we're not. And, and I love the ephemerals in the spring, the actual flowers that are called ephemerals that just pop up in the woodlands. And they're such a surprise and such a delight. Um, and the ephemerals of life, you know, they're what historians love to find the letters and the bits and pieces of someone's life because they tell you more about what's going on in their lives and um, the history and um, yeah, background. Yeah, yeah, so ephemeral. And, and I, that's kind of the flotsam and jetsam of life. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I really, I'm a bit of a magpie, so those are the things that I see real um, beauty and possibility in. Yeah. Is that why you described it as junk yeah. <laughs> at, at one point, but is that why you're drawn to like the things that everybody else would walk past? Is that part of it or stuff that you would just I, I step think on that, or throw away? Yeah. Is, I think that it is, and it gets back as well to this um, reminding myself and perhaps others who see what I create that um, the world is infused with the holy. Um, I really love the, um, the burning bush passage. Though um, Calvin and Knox tended to think of the people of God as the burning bush that we were not consumed by the, you know, the flames and arrows of life. Instead, what I love about the passage is put off your shoes, mm -hmm. that you are standing on holy ground. And really, holy ground is everywhere if we just open our eyes to it. And so um, these little bits and things, um, they remind me that the holy and goodness and beauty can be seen in the broken and um, the cast aside. So that's, and, and that's true for people, but in my doing this art, it reminds me deeply that beauty is in the broken, and we are all of us broken, right? Right, right. 
That reminds me, I love that story too in Exodus where Moses encounters the bush. I've been told this, I've never had the opportunity to look it up to make sure that I'm right and that it's true, but I've been told that some of the rabbis, much after Exodus was written, speculated that what's going on there is that the bush was always there, the bush was always burning, but Moses was the first person to ever walk by and notice it. Oh, I love that. Which is what makes that scene so holy and so special. It, like God was always there waiting to be discovered right. in this silly bush in the middle of nowhere, and Moses was the first one to be attentive enough just to see it. Yeah. Which I wonder if that connects in some ways as oh, you think deeply. about that. Yeah. Deeply. Yeah. Yeah. And, and don't we love to be seen that way? For um, that we've always been there in our fragileness, our goodness, our brokenness, our messed upness, and when we are seen, oh my gosh, that's such a holy moment. Yeah. Is there something about that, that whole experience, that, which is so rich, so personal, I, I imagine, and I'm thinking in my own life of times, you know, of being seen or of, a, or of encountering a, a piece of art, whether it's visual or musical or whatever, where you just feel like this is the right thing for me to be experiencing at this moment. Um, how much of that, you talked about that connecting to brokenness then. What does that look like for you as somebody with creative gifts that I don't think I have? Are you creating things for yourself in the sense that it's good for you? Or do you also have to think about what does, especially for your liturgical art, what does the congregation need at this moment? Or what does the audience need to see at this moment? Do you see what I mean? How much, I do see what you mean. Where, are, where do you have to... And there, um, so when I'm making just general art, when I'm making things, it's for me and it's a process that I'm involved in. And when I'm making art for a community, I think of my place in it so it is informed by who I am because I can't step out of that role. I mean, I'm always in it somehow. But I do think about who the people are and who this particular community is. So the liturgical art that I've made has always been very site specific and really specific for a period of time that I created it for. And um, I, um, there are a couple pieces that they keep using um, at Old First in San Francisco. And I'm always delighted by it and a little puzzled. Um, and some of them, when I look back on it, it's like, you know, that was kind of cool. I'm always kind of surprised by that part of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I kind of like that. I kind of like that still. Um, there's a particular uh, cloth that went over the communion table for a um, Monday, Thursday into Good Friday service that um, I created out of a bunch of scrap fabric, sort of a pieta, um, but it's built on um, an underlayment that you can kind of see through, so you can kind of see the table underneath. Mm -hmm. um, you see this figure, but because you can see underneath the table, it has a bit of a feel of a tomb. You know, it's a lot of things going on. But I knew that for that congregation, that piece worked. Um, it worked because of the furniture we had in place. It worked because of the people that were there. That piece, mm, I don't think it would work here. It's a different place, different people, so yeah. The uh, and what's the process like for you when you do create things? Oh golly, that that's I really can't even begin to. Um, I'm not sure what the process is. I'm always surprised a little bit by it, and that sounds so woo woo, where people talk about their muse or whatever. I don't even get any of that stuff. Um, but I am surprised by it, and things come, and I just begin to make, and I see where it takes me. Mm. Um, I don't paint and I don't draw because a blank sheet of paper or blank canvas completely shuts me down. I don't know what to do with it. And if I do have an idea, I'm often really not pleased with the result, with where it goes. But somehow manipulating things, those things have a life of their own, and um, surprising things happen, and I'm happy to go with that. When a mistake happens because of a brush stroke, oh my gosh, no, I'm not happy at all. 
<laughs> um, so I'm not sure that even answered the question. Partly, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I think, open up the question of how does this, how is this more than a gift that you have? So how is this also maybe a spiritual practice or exercise yeah. for you? So it does. And so that goes back to another um, biblical story. Okay. It's the story of Elisha and um, the ravens who fed Elisha in the wilderness. And you just have to hang with me. There was a period of time in my life, not that long ago, where I was doing caregiving for my mom. And I was caregiving for a lot of people in a congregation. And um, I was really depleted. I was a really empty, empty well. And I knew that I needed to step away from something and I couldn't step away from caregiving for my mom. So I stepped away from a work that I really loved. I enjoyed it and had a lot of fulfillment there, but I was no longer present in a room when I was giving care. I could say and do all the right things, but I wasn't there anymore. So I stepped away. And I was then taking care of just mom. And that was, I didn't know who I was anymore. So I thought, I'm going to start making again. And I decided I would start making clothes. <laughs> and um, I didn't want to put a lot of money into it. So I made, remade thrifted things. I thrifted clothes and repurposed them. I found um, really inexpensive yardage um, and made things. And I thought, oh, because you always have to have a purpose. You know, we're in a capitalist society. So I thought I'll set up a little Etsy shop and I'll find a name for this. Well, I had heard a sermon about Elisha and the ravens and being fed by ravens. And it really stuck with me about paying attention to where you are fed and um, the surprising ways in which we're fed. So I thought I'd call this new venture I was doing rescued by ravens because I have always loved all birds cor um, um, the corvid family and um, I'm a little bit of a magpie myself mm -hmm. picking up bits and pieces and I started making and I made a lot of clothes I taught myself again how to sew um, they were very most of the things that I was making out of just the yardage were kind of Asian inspired, very clean lines, simple. And I made a tag for them, Rescued by Ravens. And after a while, um, I even had pictures taken. I had a little website. I almost had that Etsy shop opened up, but not really. And what I realized was that the process had saved me. I had been rescued by ravens. I had been rescued by this process of making and it gave me myself back. Um, it took me a long time to learn that we pray in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And creating is a way that um, my spiritual life is fed. Um, walking is another way that my spiritual life is fed. I grew up in a place where um, praying was a thing done on your knees or um, at a, in a chair at a table. You journaled. You, it was a very limited... You fold your hands so they don't fidget, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, it took me a long time to unlearn mm. those mm, models. Yeah. I really appreciate that uh, was because so much prayer is still about silence. We had I had a great conversation with Rob Carlson that was talking about meditation and silence, and that's obviously an important part of prayer sometimes yeah. for some people in some ways. But you're talking about I think the ways in which constructing, doing, building, creating whatever verb we want to use is also not just good for one's psyche, but as a form of prayer, a form of connection then, yes. right? With God, with the world. I mean, how do you think about what, what is prayer? I guess if, if, if what you're describing is prayer, then what's, what's happening there? Or which of course, yeah. we don't know, but we, I mean, exactly, imagine we with don't, me. We don't really know, but there comes an openness, um, a, a being present to the moment. There is a listening that happens. There was a season where a whole lot of my making 
was about the work of grief. My sister had died. I didn't even realize I, this would come up. And um, I spent months in the basement. The children I would get off to school, and I would go down to the basement and just make. And it wasn't quiet. I had particular music that was playing. And those, when I hear those, they were CDs at the time. When I hear them again, it brings me back to the fullness of that time. And I'm grateful for um, the ability to have been able to just be alone with my thoughts and with my grief and um, allowing time and the the presence of God to be with me and abide in me and not try to fix me. Um, yeah. Which I think is part of what grief is, right? Is going along for a ride that's not Yeah. But, oh my gosh. Yeah. And yeah, it just keeps going, yeah. you know? Yeah. It just takes a different shape. Right. Thank goodness. Right? <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Well. <laughs> we couldn't live in that those right. early moments for very long. Right. Except when you convince yourself that it somehow is some linear process and you're almost done and you realize, no, oh. this is <laughs> No, it <laughs> just, it's a, a lifelong, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing all of that. Yeah. No, grief has been um, a part of my life. It's part of how I ended up in seminary. It's part of, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lifelong thing. I've, my brother, my older brother died when I was 15. So that was, you know, there was just, it's been a constant companion. And um, that's how I have to sort of look at it. And, but it doesn't make it any less painful, right. the familiarity. Well, and you talked about the beauty and things that are ephemeral way back in the beginning of the conversation yeah. and how we're all ephemeral. Is there a way in which, which I take to be part of kind of your, theolo your theology, right? The way you think yeah. about life and God and what a good life or fair life or unfair life might look like. But is there, um, how does this connect to, what makes this Christian for you or does it, is there something uniquely Christian or distinctively Christian about it? Or do you just happen to be Christian and this also fit? You know what I mean? Are there aspects yeah. to the, the Christian story that, that kind of nourish the sense of the beauty of the ephemeral or the chance that even in, in the grief that attends so much of life that there's still hope? Or I mean, yeah, you know, I don't, is that the wrong question to ask? No, I, I don't, wonder. I don't know that it's the wrong question to ask, but I can only answer because I'm, a Christian, because this is the faith story that I have been given, because it is the ground on which I stand. Um, when I question, and you know, we all have questions, I always come down to the point, uh, to the realization that even if none of this is true, this is still the place where I would ground my life. Um, uh, in the seasons of my life, the Trinity has been really important, all three persons of the Trinity. And right now, I'm really, this is going to sound so corny, but I'm really loving Jesus again. Um, I'm really loving the, um, oh my gosh, the stories, the parables, the life that he lived, the... Um, the death, the resurrection, the embodiment of God, God being really with us, a word made flesh, um, and um, that fleshiness of us. You know, sometimes God, the big God, Father, Mother, Creator, um, that's been easier for me to relate to. But so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this answers your question. But it's this story, this revelation that we've been given. All these metaphors that I find that the art I create somehow connects to all of this. Um, we are a story of God redeeming. Um, creation and us and um, the whole of the world. And so in my little acts, I suppose that I'm trying to redeem little bit 
bits of things, trying to help us see um, the broken as beautiful. Because um, God sees us as beautiful. And that's part of our unique story. But there's also like wabi-sabi, you know, the whole Japanese um, tradition of that. Um, lifting up of the broken and, um, uh, you know, like the uh, um, <laughs> Keith who's filming us has visible mending on his jeans. Uh -huh. That visible mending, you know, that's a real art mm -hmm. in Japan and it's beautiful and it celebrates the Is broken. that like where there's like a, a cracked piece of pottery which has the gold seams? Gold. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So it's a whole mindset that, that is not Christian. You know, so there are pieces of this that come through, I think, because as humans and the world we live in, we can't help but see that um, it could be other. Right, right. Well, and for a lot of people, I think spirituality might mean to them a notion of transcendence, a way of leaving behind the body, leaving behind yeah. the stuff of this world to some kind of more idealized existence but then of course after those moments you're right back yeah <laughs> you know and so I, I do think that a christian spirituality is is quite comfortable in the the muck and the, the mire mess. of life yeah. because that's where god is yeah think, which yeah. again isn't only a christian understanding but it's very much but is deeply right. christian understanding right yeah yeah the uh the uh, as you think about maybe your own spirituality are there other other practices that that feed you as well uh, along the way, or things yeah. that you do to tend your own your own spirit. So I thought about this, and at first, it it brought me back to you know this that high school years living in a very conservative part of the world, and oh my gosh, I don't have any of those practices. How do I even I must be answer? Must doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there <laughs> must be something trouble. wrong. But I yeah. thought, you know what? I show up. And one of the places I show up is to worship. I show up to the community that I'm part of. And that really feeds me. I can't say that every week, you know, I have some mountaintop experience. But there's something about the showing up. Um, and it's not like every week I want to. You know, sometimes it'd be easier to stay at home. And it was really hard um, during the pandemic and when things opened up again to begin to come back because um, there was fearfulness around it. And I had gotten comfortable. I figured out a way to really be at worship at home with a computer screen. But when I showed up again with other people, I realized there's this thing that happens, and that is the Spirit of God at work in the midst of people and when we're together again. So that's one of the disciplines, regular worship, regular participation in a community of faith that holds me accountable. Which it sounds like is that's partly one of the, the venues for your own creativity has been worship in that space and creating an opportunity for people to gather around an idea, an image, a thing, a, a feeling. Yeah. One last thing. You brought something. I want to make sure I you did. have a chance to show a, off your, well, your show and tell item. Well, I just brought a thing because, um, so this is called Our Lady of Celestial Seasonings. Okay. I see the, the <laughs> Can tea. Can you see the I, little? I can. So yeah, I'm she's... sure we're holding that in a good spot. <laughs> Um, so this was made a really long time ago. I actually saw that I actually signed the piece in the back and dated it. It was made in 2007. And you can see that it's made out of all cast odd objects. There's even a pull tab, pull tab is, in the back to hang. is how it's <laughs> hung. It's made with pop rivets. I think this one I didn't make any of my own rivets. I sometimes do that as well. But it's just bits and pieces of cast off tin. And um, it was made at Ghost Ranch, a place we go regularly where I think is a really thin place in the world. And um, we had these tea bags um, the celestial seasoning ones, and they used to be made in like 
foil wrappers. They don't make them that way anymore. And um, I loved it because the little Celestial Seasonings lady was made on, um, instead of being paper, um, she would weather better. And so I was able to cut her out carefully mm -hmm. and put her in and just begin to assemble. So I started with this one little image that I just loved, her holding these oranges. Yeah. And then there were all these other pieces. Part of it is um, uh, soy sauce tin. Other parts, you know, they're just bits of flotsam and jetsam. Yeah. Um, can you see what this one is? Do you know it's what that a would Coleman come? Lantern, yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So it's from the Coleman Lantern fuel um, container. You know, there's sure. come in like a little gallon container, right. and so that was left on a pile of stuff. So, um, yeah, just odd bits and pieces but you know for some reason this hangs um, in our well for some reason it hangs in our bathroom our downstairs bathroom but for some reason I still really like this piece um, there is something about it I don't even really know what that still resonates with me that I'm still glad for the pieces and the way they came together into something new and I guess that that's a little bit of a metaphor for us, you know, that we can be glad for the ways that at this point in time we still come together um, despite all the messiness, brokenness, traumas, whatever that have been done to us. And um, I don't know, I, I hope that with all the bits that have formed this life right now, that I'm pleasing. Oh yeah, that it in all God's comes together. Sight, you know that I'm beautiful. still pleasing. Yeah. Um, and that I'm working at it, and I'm still kind of rough edges. I could get <laughs> cut by this, but um, yeah. yeah. So metaphor is also really big for me, right? Sure. <laughs> I'm just kind of noticed. Oh, I love that. And this has it's been a beautiful conversation. I've really, really enjoyed it, and I'm yeah. excited about the conversations it will encourage around. Yeah grief and brokenness and reclamation and creation, uh, all of those things. Thanks so much for sharing so much of yourself with us. Thanks for inviting me.